So, a uh, 20-year spoiler warning right here, but I think it's safe to say that pretty much every single Simpsons fan on Earth already knows that Maggie Simpson shot Mr. Burns. Even if you've never seen the episodes before, there have been plenty of later ones that reference the solution, and Maggie's handiness with firearms has actually saved the day once before. As far as the Simpsons canon goes, there is no ambiguity on the subject. Maggie shot Mr. Burns. But here's what I want to know. Is the evidence against Maggie completely ironclad, or is an alternative solution even possible? And if so, then who else could have shot Mr. Burns? Okay, before we get started, let's get this disclaimer out of the way. This analysis is just for fun and is meant to give people a different way they can view these episodes. We are not going to throw around the idea that the writers are trying to cover up some dirty little secret about Springfield. Put those tinfoil hats away. This is more or less a discussion on how the Maggie Simpson solution works and whether or not we can poke any holes in it. This is supposed to be a fun conspiracy theory episode, not a life-altering delusion causing one. Ask a doctor if this video is right for you. The Who Shot Mr. Burns mystery is interesting because it is written with the intent that it is supposed to be solvable at the end of part one. They had a contest created specifically for it, so the mystery had to be set up that way. However, this structure flies in the face of how almost every murder mystery works. Typically, the murder happens, the police gather evidence and alibis afterwards, and from that information, you can logically deduce who the murderer is. When you watch a police procedural like CSI or Law & Order, you usually can't figure out who the killer is when the body is discovered. Unless, of course, you're watching Columbo. That guy breaks all the rules. But the point is, this mystery is weird. So to set the stage a little, let's go over how the Maggie Simpson solution works. In 60 seconds. Burns falls on the sun that pointing to the letters W and S. This implies the shooter is either Wayland Smithers or W. Seymour Skinner. But actually we're supposed to read the letters from his point of view, and it should be M and S. Why is that? Because all the clocks say so. Well, almost all of them. We're supposed to look at his hands like it reads 3 p.m. This means the shooter is either Mo Sizlak, Sideshow Mel, Marge Simpson, Maggie Simpson, or the Simpson Mutt. Marge is standing out front, so she's eliminated. Sideshow Mel has a knife, so he's eliminated. Mr. Burns' gun is missing, implying that was the weapon used. Mo has a shotgun, so he's eliminated. Santa's little helper is a dog, and that solution would be stupid, so he's eliminated. That only leaves Maggie. Earlier in the episode, Burns comments on taking candy from a baby. Maggie has a green lolly when she's dropped off in the car. Motive. Burns struggles with his assailant, implying the shooter is someone extremely weak like Maggie. And to cap things off, when Burns asks if anyone has the guts to stop him, Maggie is the only person who doesn't look away. And that, my friends, is how we arrive at the correct solution of Maggie Simpson. You get all that? Are you sure? Good, because we're throwing almost all of it out. The major weakness of the official solution is that it's very reliant on the usage of symbolism. The whole WS and MS stuff with the clocks form the entire basis of the solution and is basically how you eliminate almost all of Springfield. And the logic appears to be sound since this is a very common trope in detective fiction. In whodunits, victims constantly seem to be identifying their murderers with their dying breaths. Fictional murder victims are very considerate in that way. So when viewing part one by itself, all of this sundial logic makes complete sense. But then part two comes along and messes up everything. After Burns unmasks Maggie as the shooter, he basically confirms he didn't mean anything when he fell on the sundial, and it was just a coincidence. So what are we supposed to do with this now? Throw all this logic out? At this point, the only tangible evidence that really points to Maggie is Burns' accusation itself. Okay, well obviously that's a simplification and there actually is other evidence still, but it demonstrates what a logical mess Mr. Burns has created. The clocks were always symbolic nonsense, let's just be real here. As was Maggie's death stare. But now we have to throw the sundial clue in the same category. It doesn't actually prove anything. It was just symbolism put in by the writers so we could solve the thing in part one. And symbolism is not evidence. It's just a writing device. You cannot go to your local police station and explain, because it was raining during a recent murder, that the murderer must be the man selling umbrellas. They will look at you funny. And probably arrest you.
So now we're back to square one. Using the evidence presented to us in parts one and two, how can we prove it was Maggie? Let's go over the evidence. First of all, we still have motive. The whole candy from a baby motif is a little coincidental, but they do demonstrate pretty clearly that Maggie was holding a piece of candy before the shooting happened. The biggest reason why we're fooled by Maggie is because her motive isn't completely evident. Well, that and she's a baby. But in general, in these kind of mysteries where the murderer's motive is hidden, it is extremely important there are clues to it, or it is telegraphed in some way. And Who Shot Mr. Burns does this magnificently. Secondly, we have opportunity. One of the weirder things about viewing part one by itself is that it's initially not very clear where Mr. Burns was actually shot. I mean, all we see is a shadow. He could be anywhere right now. But if you look at the layout of Town Hall, as well as the direction Burns walks, you can kind of infer that he was shot in the parking lot. When he emerges afterwards, he comes from that direction. And in part two, they basically confirm he was shot there and that Maggie and Santa's little helper were witnesses. Everything checks out so far. Next, we have the Simpsons DNA, revealed in part two. This doesn't point directly to Maggie, but it does narrow things down significantly. If we're looking at DNA alone, it means only Homer, Bart, Lisa, Maggie, or Grandpa could be the shooter. Or it could be her pal, I suppose. Or maybe Homer's British half-sister. But for now, let's just stick to people who, you know, are actually in the episodes. That being said, if we're going to step out on a limb and suggest the shooter wasn't one of the Simpsons, then obviously your solution has to explain how the DNA still got there. Now let's consider that Burns seems to be struggling with someone before he was shot. The show suggests that this implies he was struggling with someone physically weak, like Maggie or Grandpa. But this isn't as helpful as one might think. Since we only hear Burns fighting with someone, the only thing we can deduce is that Burns is weaker than his shooter. Not actually that helpful. The coolest link about the Maggie Simpson solution is that the struggle becomes a callback to the climax of Rosebud, where the two of them do exactly the same thing. In a surprising usage of continuity, the writers have telegraphed how Maggie ended up doing the shooting. Not bad for a series that doesn't plan things in advance. Finally, let's talk about Burns' gun. Burns' gun disappears at the end of part one, and the evidence in part two proves that was the weapon used. The gun was found on the floor of the Simpsons family car. This doesn't necessarily point to anyone in particular. In fact, it doesn't really eliminate all the people who already have weapons since, you know, they could have chosen to do it with a weapon that can't be traced to them. Seems like a smart idea to me. There's nothing stopping Sideshow Mel from putting his knife away and taking Burns' gun. That being said, if we're going with an alternative theory, we have to explain why the shooter didn't just take the gun away with him or her or leave it lying on the ground. What would tossing the gun in the car actually get them? The gun is one of those clues that doesn't necessarily point to Maggie, but it does fit in with the other evidence against her. Combine it with the Simpsons' DNA, the struggle we overheard, and the fact that Maggie is present for the shooting, and it paints a pretty clear picture of what probably happened. It's all a smidge coincidental, as none of these things necessarily put the gun in Maggie's hand, but come on, given these facts, it's clearly the most likely explanation. And while we're at it, let's just drop the nuclear bomb of evidence against Maggie Simpson and call it a day. The one piece of evidence that basically removes all doubt about Maggie being the shooter. And that bit of evidence comes at the very end of part two. It's the fact that Mr. Burns himself accuses Maggie of committing the shooting. I left this one for the end because I wanted to go through the actual logic of how we could deduce the solution before Mr. Burns just blurts it out. Also, because if we're going to try to come up with an alternative theory, then this is obviously a very, very, very large stumbling block. If Maggie Simpson did not shoot Mr. Burns, then you have to explain why Mr. Burns says she did. That's very difficult. Difficult, but not impossible. But still very difficult. Let's not mince words. Any explanation we come up with is going to venture into cuckoo bananas conspiracy theory stuff. Like, let's say we think Skinner actually was the shooter and the whole thing was over the oil. We could pretty easily brush aside his alibi in part two, since Chalmers is the one corroborating it and has a very good reason to cover up for him. But then you have to construct some kind of blackmail argument for why Burns wouldn't just unmask him, and things start falling apart. Burns legally already had access to the oil, so blackmailing Skinner wouldn't actually get him anything. You'd have to come up with another explanation. Then you have to consider people who already have stone-cold alibis for the shooting. Like, as amazing as Moe is at various things, I highly doubt that he could beat a lie detector. Smithers, meanwhile, was a little busy with a shooting of his own at the time. 
Other people like Tito Puente, Willy, or Skinner, as discussed before, have sort of flimsy joke alibis that you could probably argue around. We're basically looking for someone who would explain why Mr. Burns chooses to accuse Maggie at the end of Part 2, as well as fitting in with the rest of the evidence. It has to explain the Simpsons' DNA, the struggle we overheard, the gun being left in the Simpsons' car, as well as why only Homer's fingerprints were found on it later. And finally, it would be really nice if the solution made sense in the actual narrative of the episodes. Not to knock the Maggie solution too much, but her being the shooter is the equivalent of it being done by the dog with the shifty eyes. This is probably my biggest criticism of the episodes in general. While Maggie being the shooter is very funny and unexpected, her lack of involvement in the story makes the solution a little disappointing. If we're going to pick a different person as the shooter, hopefully it's someone that contributes to the story. So, given all those tedious stipulations and qualifications, does such a person exist in Springfield? In my opinion, two suspects are clearly indicated. Join me in parts 2 and 3 of this video series where we look at these theories and basically laugh at how batshit insane all of this is.